And so today I would like to, I'm very uh, pleased and, uh, and, and excited to introduce Howard Barry Schatz uh, uh, to, to this podcast. And uh, just to say a little bit about uh, Howard, he has a very, very interesting background. He is a um, retired computer scientist, uh, specialist, classically trained computer, uh, composer, music theorist, jazz musician, and author. After 35 years, uh, Howard recently retired from the New York City Department of Education, where he spent many years overseeing its computer division as the manager of quality assurance and network architecture. As a composer, he has written a symphony and many chamber pieces. As a weekend jazz musician, Howard has been a fixture on the NYC scene. His most memorable engagements include two years playing Cole Porter's piano at the Waldorf Astoria's Peacock Alley, eight years at Bill's uh, Gay 90s, a legendary New York speakeasy, and two years at legendary jazz club Gregory's, as well as multi-year engagements at the Barbizon Hotel, the Sutton Hotel, and so forth. Uh, about today's discussion, um, to say a little bit, Howard has spent 45 years deciphering, 45 years, which is a phenomenal amount of time uh, and dedication, uh, to put it mildly, uh, deciphering and authenticating uh, monotheism's most ancient and sacred text, the Sefer Yetzira, or Book of Creation. These are the only writings attributed to the great patri patriarch Abraham, by many within the Hasidic Jewish community and within that community, they, uh, these writings that are, um, these are the seminal writings uh, on monotheism and Kabbalah. Although the book of creation, that is the Sefer Yetzira, is widely considered the oldest Kabbalistic text and the seminal writings on monotheism, the academic world has largely ignored it, primarily because no one until now has been able to convincingly link it to the Hebrew Bible. This, uh, this lack of a convincing link until now is just one of the uh, few historical, philological and archeological challenges to the book uh, of creation's authenticity. Howard has uh, addressed and he refutes each of these challenges. He believes that his efforts should put the book of creation on a firm academic footing for the first time. Again, to remind us, this is uh, 45 years of, of work he's put into this. Um, he is convinced that the writings of Abraham provides a profound theological common ground among the three Abrahamic faiths, a framework for a true and lasting peace. Uh, with that said, I would like to hand it over to Howard to, uh, to tell us about his very, very fascinating research. I had the incredible uh, privilege and pleasure of meeting uh, Howard recently, actually through my good friend, uh, DeForest uh, Raphael. Um, and he spoke to me a little bit about his work and in, uh, to put it mildly, I, my mind was blown. It's very interesting, very rich, uh, very challenging. Uh, it really uh, took me out of my comfort zone many times. Uh, and uh, I'm very eager to, to, to hear more from uh, Howard today. And uh, so that, uh, thank you, Howard. Thank you, Hassan, I appreciate it. And I certainly appreciate uh, the Reverend DeForest uh, introducing me to you. Yes, yes. Um, oh, DeForest, uh, Reverend DeForest, yes. the very <laughs> great spirit. And there he is. There, and there I am. And spirit and, and I mean, he's, uh, <laughs> Reverend DeForest is a great uh, presence in my life. Uh, I, I, with no exaggeration, and um, the very kind Reverend knows this, I, I consider him to be um, you know, a father figure and a mentor. And uh, yeah, every time I hear his voice, he gives me great peace. And I, I, you, everyone listening in will, fi will find this, no doubt. It is a great baritone. <laughs> very, very <laughs> it good. is. He's a wonderful <laughs> singer and musician. It's soulful, so much soul, yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all so very much. Um, yes. I am excited, if I can, just for a minute about this work that Howard is engaged in. Um, it, it, without, you know, having to plumb the depths of it, he's been doing this work for a number of years. Um, and I must admit that the first uh, few times that I heard it, it did sound rather esoteric. But at the same time, there is a profound sense 
of truth that sometimes escapes my conscious awareness. Uh, so it, the hunch, uh, the kind of intuitive uh, resonance that this bears for me has been enough for me to be willing to, to follow and to listen and to grow and to learn. And my hope is that those who are participating in uh, the Zoom or those who are uh, watching this uh, via YouTube will have the same experience. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, let me just say a couple of words about how I came to this and why I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a member of the clergy and why I would consider myself uh, even qualified to open this book. You're not supposed to open this book according to the Kabbalistic and Jewish tradition uh, until you've learned all there is to know about the Torah and et cetera. Um, while I was in high school, I was into something called the Harmony of the Spheres. So, sorry, sorry, Howard, I apologize. Uh, I can't hear you that clearly. I mean, I can hear you. Maybe uh, the sound, maybe. Can How's that? It. Is that better? That's awesome. <laughs> That's okay, great. Um, in high school, I got into. Sorry, sorry to uh, interrupt again. I don't think. No, that's okay. I don't think you have to speak directly into it. Maybe whatever you did, in, as far as adjusting the volume, that really helped a lot. So okay. I think the distance that you had originally was totally fine. Okay. Yeah, Is perfect. This... That's Excellent. Okay. Yes. So I was into mathematics and I was into music. Um, but when I got to college, uh, I wrote a paper on Boethius, who was the, the Pythagorean uh, of the time. Uh, Boethius was uh, around uh, 500 CE or AD. And he was the, I think he's often credited for bringing knowledge of the ancient Greeks to the church. Um, so I wrote this paper, but it was, um, I was called to the chairman's office because uh, the chairman, the deputy chairman and my professor didn't quite, didn't quite know what to make of it. They wound up, so I tried my best to explain it. I wound up, give, they gave my paper to this Dr. Ernest McLean and, um, Ernest became my friend and mentor. I, they, they set up a, an honor seminar graduate course so I could study independently with Ernest for a couple of years. And his uh, life's work was devoted to finding the Pythagorean underbelly of, uh, of Plato. And that's what his life's work focused on. But in the time I spent with him, um, we studied Plato and we studied the Rig Veda the oldest um, Hindu text, the four Vedas, the Rig Veda is the oldest. And so that was a turning point in my life. I started um, auditing courses in a Hasidic yeshiva, a rabbinical seminary in Brooklyn uh, with the Lubavitch, uh, a place called Hadah HaTorah. And uh, I learned about the Tanya, which was the Bible of Hasidus for them. It's, it's their main book on they're the ones who carry the ball for Kabbalah, I believe, for the most part, uh, among the, the Jewish folk, uh, which I am. Um, and um, so that's what what I found was all of the things that McLean were teaching was teaching me. All of the numbers started showing up in these old Jewish books, and I found the Tanya, the Torah, the Talmud. I studied. But it was the Sefer Yetzira that I discovered as the most, the oldest and most authoritative uh, Kabbalistic text. But it, it, I didn't. But I found these numbers showing up from McLean in here, and so I brought McLean my uh, a Tanya and a Sefer Yetzira and said, you know, if you want to uh, solve the quote Bible code, I believe this is the, these are the two books we need to to study, to figure out. So I spend the rest of my life trying to do just that. And this is the result, this little uh, PowerPoint here. It's sort of, uh, yeah. anyway, let me get started. That's how I came to this stuff. Um, and I, let's see, there we go. Um, Karen Armstrong wrote a wonderful book called uh, A History of God. She's a theologian. 
And she describes uh, the quest of ninth century Muslim sect. And I love this quote uh, from her. They wanted to find a kernel of truth that lay at the heart of all the various historical religions, which since the dawn of history had been trying to define the reality of the same God. Now that's of course a tall order. And uh, so that's sort of what's driving my own initiative. Um, what I discovered subsequently was that the, that there is a whole genre of wisdom texts based on, including scripture, that are very much based, whether people know it or not, on the seven liberal arts. Um, you know, it has roots in the ancient world, but it made its way to be the, the Middle Ages educational system and the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. And there are still vestiges of it, of liberal arts in today's colleges. Unfortunately, I don't believe they understand how to teach it in so far as you study the separate disciplines, but you don't learn how to integrate them into a holistic view of reality. And once you've really mastered that, you couch it in language uh, skills, uh, rhetoric, dialectic, and discourse being the trivium. So the quadrivium, which I believe in Latin is four paths or and trivium make up the seven liberal arts. And we're familiar with Renaissance men or polymaths. Why polymaths? Because those are men who actually have learned how to be interdisciplinary enough to integrate these four separate disciplines. Here's just a few examples. Um, now, there is a rabbi, Joseph Gikatilla, in his Gates of Light, um, which, you know, he was Middle Ages, he was a student of Abraham Abelafia, one of the most important Kabbalists in history in the Middle Ages. And um, this was his main student, Kikatilla. And this was one of his most important quotes from my perspective, that the entire Torah is like an explication of and commentary on the ineffable name of God. Now, the ineffable name of God is down here and uh, we know it as Yahweh or Jehovah, I mean, an English transliteration. But a Jew is not even, is sort of forbidden to even attempt to pronounce it. So when we pray, we say Adonai, instead of attempting to pronounce that, because the last person who knew how to pronounce that word was the last high priest of Solomon's temple, who was murdered, kidnapped and murdered, around 586 BC when Solomon's temple was destroyed. So ever since then, the meaning and pronunciation of this word of God has been unknown. And um, now let me just say a few words about Gikatila's teacher, Abraham Avalafia. As a, 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 a student of this, uh, uh, Islamic uh, studies, uh, Hassan, um, people have called his prophetic, uh, ecstatic Kabbalah very Sufi-like. And so um, I'm not judging one way or the other, whether it is or isn't, but um, Abulafia very much um, believed in an ecstatic, uh, a deep meditation where you... Um, anyway, so let's just leave that alone. But here we go. Here's another important quote. And this is really the key question that has to be answered that hasn't been answered for some 2,500 years regarding the word of God. All those deep and hidden things which issue from God's thought and are taken up by the voice of God, which are not disclosed till the word reveals them. So the Zohar is perhaps the most, I'm not sure, whether your listening audience knows much or anything about Kabbalah, but the Zohar is considered the most authoritative uh, um, Kabbalistic text, primarily, I believe, because it's the most accessible. Um, the Sefer Yitzhira has, in my estimation, not been properly understood because it's because they're all mathematical riddles. And that that um, has never, you know, people, have, the rabbinical community has never 
been able to get underneath that um, that mathematics. Uh, so let's just move on. Uh, well, here is a, a just a history. So Abraham is alleged to have lived somewhere around 2000 to 1700 BC or thereabouts. And there is a history of the word. Uh, it's a, perhaps a Kabbal, part, partly a Kabbalistic history of the, of the word, but it starts with the first holy man who, who is said to know how to pronounce the word. And that would be Enoch, who is seven generations from Adam. So we're looking at the Torah, the book of Genesis. And Enoch then taught his direct relative because Enoch was in the patriarchal lineage. Oh, um, yes, he was. And he taught um, Noah three generations later. Noah is said to have passed this knowledge um, on to his son, Shem. And Shem, there is a belief that Shem reincarnated as Melchizedek, who initiated Abraham into these secrets. Um, Abraham, of course, passed it on to both Isaac, Ishmael, um, and um, it, it, it went through uh, Isaac, uh, jo uh, Jacob, Joseph, and then there were three lost generations before I, I, I imagine God was compelled to take Moses to the top of the mountain and, and teach him not only the written law, but the oral law, which is the inner meaning of the written law. So he, he, Moses received the word, the word being that one holy name. There is, if you think of uh, Einstein's E equals MC squared, it seems simple on the surface but there's a lot under the covers. So too with the ineffable name, what we, we refer to it indirectly as Hashem, the name. Um, we don't even try to spell it. You, you spell it yud heh vav -Hey, but you'll often say yud K vav K to lower the vibration. You wouldn't write it on a piece of paper because you have to throw the paper out. So this name of God is very much what being a Jew is all about. And, and as we went through history, you see the two kingdoms and the destruction uh, of um, the second temple is over here, Solomon's temple. I mean, not the second temple. Here is, is um, the destruction of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians. But then 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king destroyed Solomon's temple, 586 BC or so. And that began the Babylonian captivity. And so Jews were in, well, Israelites were in exile from Jerusalem until the Persian king, uh, Cyrus the Great, I believe, uh, allowed, he defeated the last Babylonian king and allowed the Israelites to return to Jerusalem to begin building their second temple, which they finished 516 BC or thereabouts. Um, Ezra the scribe is the one who's credited with bringing the Torah back uh, to Jerusalem. And the last uh, books, I believe, in the, in, the, uh, in the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible, include the books of Nehemiah and Ezra. And so Judaism as we know it today, because of the loss of the meaning pronunciation of the word, consider themselves in exile from God. Just as they were in exile from Jerusalem back in 539 BC, they are in exile from God today until such time as the meaning and pronunciation of the word is restored. So here is a little dramatization of that. Um, and so the Babylonian captivity, uh, many of the scholars say that's when the you know, the Hebrew language is being lost. They were, people were learning Aramaic, you know, when they were captive in Babylon. And also this is, uh, many scholars say, this is when the stories of the Bible were compiled and assembled into the, into the version that we know of today as the Tanakh. Tradition has Moses uh, writing the five books of Moses 
around 1300 BC or thereabouts uh, in, 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 um, in, in ancient uh, Canaan, uh, it, the Ugaritic texts are the pre-biblical predecessor, the pre-biblical um, predecessor in language and religion, but let's not go too far yet. Let's just continue with this. I thought this was an interesting perspective especially because this is somewhat of an interfaith uh, discussion. The Freemasons follow, you know, if, if, if the Lubavitch are, are carrying the ball for, for Kabbalah, Isaac Luria is the father of modern Kabbalah. Uh, he's generally considered that. But the Freemasons always followed the rabbi's lead. And the Freemasons is not that old a group, uh, although... I think 17, 17 in London or something like that. But they like to tie their, hitch their stars up to, um, up to uh, Solomon's temple as masons, the construction. They believe that mankind at one point knew the blueprint of creation. <laughs> yeah. Veronica, are you part of the group here? What's going on? Yeah, tell her to mute herself. Yes, yeah, she did join in. She asked if she could join in. I just thought she has to okay. mute herself. Okay. Um, so here is um, a, a nice paragraph to read. As far as the impact of the, the word uh, on, um, on, on the uh, Jewish people, and basically it summarizes what I've just said, but it's a nice thing to read. This is a Freemason perspective. I got this from a, a 19th century Freemason encyclopedia. And so this gives you an idea. So I'll just take a second for you guys to read that. Okay, so let's move on. Um, now, the, the secret of knowledge, Raza Dereta. Uh, if I saw it in Hebrew, I could probably pronounce it better. But, but the secret of knowledge is also, the Raza Dereta also translates to the secret of knowledge, the secret of the Torah, or the secret of the 22 foundation letters, all of which is bound up in the meaning and pronunciation of the holy name. Right? There were, subsequently, years later, uh, actually probably after my first book, I found, I discovered that there were two scholars, Leo Beck, and Karen Armstrong, I think, teaches at Leo Beck Institute in, in uh, England. And Gershon Shalom, probably the leading secular authority on Kabbalah, he taught at he mysticism at Hebrew University. They both believe that the book of creation can only be deciphered by applying the Pythagorean tradition, better known as the harmony of the sphere. Pythagoras is commonly thought of as the father of ancient string theory, if anybody's ever heard of string theory. If you pick up a book on the modern theory of everything, there's always a chapter on Pythagoras and as being the father of string theory. But the Sefer Yetzirah string theory can be dated to the old Babylonian period, at least 1,200 years before the birth of Pythagoras. Unfortunately, neither Beck nor Shalom knew enough Pythagorean mathematics to decipher the text, not test, text themselves. So it took me over 45 years. If I, if I begin my clock with Ernest McLean, uh, it took me over 45 years to decipher and authenticate the book of creation as a Babylonian base 60 mathematical treatise on ancient string theory all of which has been encrypted in um, Hashem, Hashem's name um, and hidden in plain sight for almost 2,500 years. It can be demonstrated that the mathematics of Yahweh shapes and structures all biblical allegory. And therein is something new because uh, as I believe uh, Hassan mentioned, there, these are the main objections to taking this book seriously. First and foremost, um, no one has ever discovered a substantial relationship between the book of creation and the Hebrew Bible. And 
Um, and if Abraham was actually the author, one would think that there is some substantial and direct connection between them. That fact has given philologists the liberty to suggest or to state that that this text was written in a late vernacular of biblical Hebrew. If biblical Hebrew only goes back as a Semitic abjad script to 400 BC, the vernacular that's used in the Sefer Yetzirah goes between 200 and 600 uh, of the common era. And that would have been about at least 2000 years after Abraham would have lived. So, um, you know, the, the, the Semitic scripts that things are written down in, language is one thing, but the way it's written down, these abject Semitic scripts go back um, 400 BC, say, to biblical Hebrew, 600 or so, and a philologist can feel free to correct me here. Aramaic, my understanding, is 600 BC. Um, Paleo-Hebrew, 1000 BC. Phoenician, 1200 BC. Proto-Canaanite, 1550 BC. Proto-Sinaitic, 1850 BC. If it wasn't in one of those um, earlier Semitic scripts, philologists just basically write it off, never believing that this book could have, it was important enough to be part of an important oral tradition. So the philologists argue any text written during the time of Abraham would have been written in the Semitic script more appropriate to the old Babylonian period, such as Proto-Canaanite or proto -Sinaitic. Third item, third argument against taking this text seriously is that there's no archeological evidence to suggest that Abraham was anything more than just a biblical character. Excuse me one minute. So how did I deal with these three? Number one, you can't get anywhere. And rabbis have as brilliant and as wonderful as the, the, the verbal tradition of Kabbalah is, thanks very much to Isaac Luria, they have never been able to decipher this text as a mathematical treatise. Um, and you can't make any connections unless... The connections are to the mathematic, to the mathematical content, and they can be it can be tightly coupled that mathematical content to to the Hebrew Bible. So much so that um, well, just as Gikatilla said, more or less said that Yahweh is the owner's manual for for the Hebrew Bible. I would say. Biblical allegory is basically embroidered around this lost Abrahamic mathematics. Once the book of creation's mathematical, number two, once the mathematical content is extracted, it can also be applied to the textual exegesis of the earliest pre-biblical Canaanite creation stories, written in the earliest Semitic Abjad Ugaritic script. Now, there's a well, it's well documented exactly when these stories were transcribed but the consensus is that they they were not composed then that they actually their composition goes back several centuries prior to the time of abraham so um by i i believe that first of all linking so tightly coupling uh the sefer yitzira to the tanakh basically renders um philologist arguments moot. I mean, it still has to be determined how it all happened. But once you've basically explained the, 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 the uh, biblical allegory based on this mathematics, you know, it's, it's kind of their job, the philologists, to figure out how it all took place. Now, the third one is a problem for most um, because it's difficult to grasp. We all think of Abraham as a real person. Uh, many of in the religious, uh, many of the religious um, folk do. And the numerology. Uh, here's the thing: once you've deciphered this numerology, it's not numerology; it's real mathematics and physics. 
But once you get that Abraham's Hebrew name is a is a is a mathematical subset of Yahweh, then it changes the whole complexion of things. Imagine, you know, <laughs> Michelangelo. Yeah, uh, in, in Islam, correct me if I'm wrong, Hassan. You shouldn't even render a a, a painting of of Muhammad or. But now trying to render a, an image of Yahweh on the Sistine Chapel ceiling is somewhat, um, well, I won't say blasphemous, but anthropomorph uh, anthropomorphizing Yahweh with an, as a grandfatherly old man with a beard. Now you, you realize what we're talking about. If, if Abraham's name is such a high uh, vibration mathematical subset, and it is, it's sort of half of the half of the, um, I mean, we'll understand later what I mean, but it's really an important uh, divine subset. So looking for Abraham's bones sort of misses the point. Um, so uh, it doesn't really even matter. The man who, whoever wrote the Sefi Yitzhira is the man that history has come to know as Abraham. And I don't believe we should buck tradition but, you know, if you find out that the guy's name was actually Ishka Bibble, it doesn't matter because that name uh, is part and parcel of Yahweh, which explains the Tanakh. Let me, let me interject question. something just as an, as an illustration. Uh, okay. They don't, you know, this analogies don't prove anything, but they help to illustrate. And let me illustrate this point. There's this great controversy that there was, at least at some point, whether or not all of the books attributed to Shakespeare were actually written by Shakespeare. And so at one point, someone said, well, either Shakespeare wrote them or a guy by the name of Shakespeare wrote them. It really doesn't matter. What matters is the text. Perfect. Thank you. All right, moving right along. Here is the actual secret of knowledge. Let's dig in a bit. Now, here is the rabbinical community's take on deciphering the Sefer Yetzirah. Very pretty geometric shapes. We see a, a triangular shape. Uh, uh, it looks like an isosceles triangle, but you notice that they're trying to pair two Hebrew letters. And that's the problem. They don't know, never knew how to pair the Hebrew letters. And their approach um, from Abu Lafia to Luria, you name it, they, the approach to Kabbalah has been linguistic manipulation, taking them as letters. Now in Hebrew, Hebrew letters are also numerals. But as you know, there is a, a, a discipline of gematria where you take the numerical value of a word, say Abraham's name, is 248. When he was born, it was two, it was Abram without the hay, which is Ruach HaKodesh, the, whole, the breath of God, the Holy Spirit. So when that was added to his name, from two, his name went from 243 to 248. That's an important number. In fact, there are 613 commandments or mitzvot that a, a Jew has to perform 365 of them you might think of as a yoga of purification of the body. And 248 is sort of a, just to make an analogy to a, another religion, is a yoga of, of liberation of the soul. Okay. That discipline of liberation of the soul we'll discuss in more detail later. But for now, just realize that, you know, making pretty geometric pictures of a of a square, a triangle, and a circle with, you know, nice connections, trying to figure out how they could possibly. Uh... So remember, we're talking about the sound of God's voice. So the real approach to sound is understanding integer ratios. When you pair numbers, you're creating an integer ratio, a musical ratio, so that the number one to two gives you an octave. If you have a string that's that's a foot long, one, and then uh, and then a half of that is six inches, and then you sound them, it's going to be an octave away because two to one ratio always gives you an octave in physics. Do, 
do, re, mi, fa, so, la, si, do, bum, bum, right? Two to three gives you a fifth, do, re, mi, fa, so, bum, bum. Three to four gives you a fourth, four to five a major third, five to six a minor third. And that's how creation was formed. And here is the proof in the pudding. These are the integer ratios of creation of, uh, here's the symbolism of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, tree of life. You see the pyramids come from here. The, the star of David comes from here. All of the great religious symbolism uh, is just a, a description, a, sim a symbol of the underlying uh, mathematics. And so um, that is sort of the point. Now, how do we get here? Did I just pull it out of a well, out of a hat? No, it took quite a bit to figure this stuff out. So we'll just begin at the beginning. Uh, actually, this is the second stanza of uh, Sefer Yetzirah, 10 Spirit of Nothingness and 22 Foundation Letters. And the 22 foundation letters are further divided into three mothers, seven doubles, and 12 elementals. What does it mean? They're mathematical riddles. The first of the riddles uh, is, of, is, um, of these divine thoughts is the 10 sphere of nothingness. Now, the word sphere doesn't mean chakra or sphere. It means counting. So God counted from one to 10, and poof, the cre you know, creation happened. Not quite, but, you know, that's, you know, an interesting and overly, overly simplistic way to look at it. Encrypted in the first Hebrew letter, Yud, of God's holiest name, during Olam HaTohu, when Olam ha, there, there, creation happened in two phases, uh, Olam HaTohu and Olam HaTikun. And... Tohu, when in Genesis, the world was, Olam is world, was tohu and vohu, unordered and void. And the ten utterances of nothingness brought order to the darkness and the chaos. Okay. So when, when in the Bible, let there be light, there's a mathematical model for that. And also darkness was created on day one as well. And there's a mathematical model for that. Okay, so the, the second day of creation uh, is, well, before we get to that, let's look at the second here. The second of God's thoughts is broken into three separate riddles, each of which must be dissimilarly deciphered from its own three layers of meaning, all of which can be deciphered the, from the last three letters of the Tetragrammaton. It's called the Holy Tetragrammaton, those four sacred letters. Uh, the last three, hey, vav, hey, um, is the basis of Olam HaTikun, the reordering of light. There, uh, Isaac Luria has two doctrines, Timtum and Shiverit HaKalim. These are the two foundation Kabbalistic doctrines, since Luria is the father of modern Kabbalah. And um, without knowing the details of the mathematics, uh, Luria came very close, just using verbal and very minimal uh, numbers, you know, 231 gates, where do you go with that? Where do you go from there? But he, his, his verbal explanation, Kabbalah is a verbal explanation of actual mathematical constructions. That's what Kabbalah is. In, in effect, that's what biblical allegory is as well. Let's move on. Okay, this is actually the first stanza, or most of the first stanza. Um, there are three layers of meaning, text, number, and sound. Now, this word in, in Hebrew, it's actually telling or communication, but it's God doing the telling. And the critical part is to understand that we're talking about the sound of God's voice, which requires mathematics and physics to understand. And I would say that acoustics is probably as old, if not older, than astronomy as an ancient. Ancient string theory goes back beyond <laughs> Abraham 
monotheism you know what i said that 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 this mathematics goes back to ugarit which is a syrian port um, an ancient syrian port where they found many cuneiform tablets uh, the pre-biblical Canaanite people where Elohim was God among gods. It's a plural in Hebrew. So Elohim was, in the Bible, it tells you that Abraham knew Elohim. And El, right, is uh, Allah, is God. It just means God. Yahweh was a later development. And in the Bible, it says Moses knew Yahweh and Abraham knew Elohim. So how then, it seems contradictory, how then could Abraham have written the text on Yahweh? So um, the, the point is that um, those writings were from the time of Moses, um, the, the um, Ugaritic texts. And during that period, this would have been Elohim, who was the head of the Canaanite pantheon of gods. So be that, you know, there's some riddles and conundrums created, but um, I think we just follow the facts where they lead. And here is the main riddle of the first two days of creation. How? He permuted them, weighed them, and transformed them. That same sounds very numerical or mathematical. Olive with them all, and all of them with olive. Bet with them all, and all of them with bet. They repeat in the cycle and exist in 231 gates. It comes out that all that is formed and all that is spoken emanates from one name. The name, of course, is Yahweh. So, um, since Hebrew letters are also numbers, Uh, line one suggests that uh, we change Kikatilla's view from linguistic manipulation to numeric manipulation. Olive with them all, all of them with olive. Here we go. Here's olive with them all. So the with them all is the rest of the Hebrew alphabet, but there were 10 spirit of nothingness, God's voice uttered. So what we're talking about is God uttering 10. So that's 11. There is no number, uh, numeral 11 in Hebrew. It jumps up to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 200, 300, 400. Those are the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So we're dealing with one over 20. But what is these? what are these numbers? Think of string theory as a vibrating string. It has half the string, a third of the string, a quarter of the string, a fifth, etc. The thing is that they all happen at the same time, all of these vibrations. By the way, this is called the Kav in, 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 um, in Kabbalah, which is a sequential. I mean, that's, you know, the verbal Kabbalah is very close because it's a real description of mathematical constructions. It knows that it's sequential and God uttered his light came from, these, from this utterance. Um, here it is in physics. Now, you know, many people will say, oh, the harmonic series wasn't known um, until Joseph Savard, a Frenchman, and, or um, anyway, the point is, you know, it's true that the, the, the ideas of frequency and wavelength, I think Galileo had a hand in that, but these were not known, the terms were not known, but the math was known. And so if you take a simple string, they created strings in ancient Sumer, 2600 BC. Richard Dumbrell writes about the silver lyre of Ur. Ur was the town Abraham was born in. And that's 2600 BC. And so you've got a frequency of three and a wavelength of a third. They're reciprocals. You know, uh, here, let's see, in modern terms, Oh, all right, let's go through all of this. The entire set of harmonics is called a harmonic series or a harmonic progression. Abraham thought of this as the mathematics of the rainbow. Um, he had 10 utterances and he got seven sounds and colors out of those 10. The human ear, ear can hear up to 16 harmonics, but Abraham only needed 10 to define the voice of God. In modern terms, the vibration of a string has a, has a certain frequency that is measured in time 
cycles per second, hertz. While the length of each cycle's vibration from crest to crest is measured in space as wavelength. So wavelength can be correlated with string length. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency or pitch. Pitch is highness or lowness of sound and vice versa. Here's a little sample. Don't worry about the equal tempered part. I was just playing my piano to give you a sample. It, it, it approximates the harmonic series. Um, sorry, um, Howard, we, we didn't hear, we didn't hear the sound. You're not hearing the sound? No, no. Oh, I apologize. Let me see if there's anything I can do about that. Maybe I think it has to come through the speakers, uh, through your computer speakers in order to. Yeah, um, not sure how to do that. Let's see. If, um, if I turn this, my speaker all is all the way up yeah you know i think um one way around this is just to momentarily unplug your headphones as that's playing and then replug your oh. headphones in. Oh, so i think the mic the mic would capture it yeah but Great. you may have to have the volume all the way up yes let's try that so i can't hear you guys yet but hopefully you'll hear this maybe uh, let me just make sure my volume is up it is Okay, so here we go. Let's try again. I have no idea if you're hearing it. Um, not hearing it, sorry, Howard. So it's not coming through. No, <laughs> I think Howard can't hear us now. Yeah, right, he, he can't hear us. We heard oh, it the last time, I don't know. Speaker. Let me try that. I'll bet you're not hearing this. No, we, we are not. Outside, right. external speaker. By the way, DeForest, I don't know what your experience is like. I mean, this is my maybe roughly second time around, second and a half. And it's still like, I feel like I could go through this 10 times and I'd still be- Yeah, so and still be kind of like, huh? <laughs> but in a good way right right in a good way yeah, in an excellent I assume way you but... didn't hear that no we no we did know. not okay let's try it again i have my external speaker on hold okay perfect yeah Perfect. That was perfect. With that? That was great. Yes. Right? Yes, we did. Nice. Yes. That was better. Hello. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. Let's yeah. move on. Uh, all right. At least I know how to demonstrate this. Here is darkness. The creation of darkness. It's a constriction of light. And that is the, the Lurianic doctrine of Tsimtsum. So, God's light is in the highest realm, and as it comes down into darkness, it's really a constriction of light, rather, so darkness is a result of less of God's light. And here is the two of them together, day one of creation, where uh, there's a separation between light and darkness, and uh, you see uh, light, Aleph with them all, and all of them with Aleph is darkness. Um, here is bet with them all and all of them with bet, etc., until you get the heavenly firmament. Now, the Zohar says these are not discoverable, these secret paths, but they are, and they're all, you know, you have to just decipher the Sefi uh, Just, <laughs> you know, my dad thought I was wasting my life and time, you know, that you know, McLean read my books and I read McLean and it's just the three of us, God and the two of us. And, you know, why don't I get a real job? 
uh, type of thing. But uh, sometimes that's the best way. If uh, <laughs> you know, and, and yeah, I think sometimes the most interesting work happens in small groups of people, and then when it's ready, whenever God. I mean, whenever it's ready and God decides so, then it, it just has this incredible. Right, right. Yeah, yeah you, 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 you're usually on to something when nobody wants to pay you any attention. <laughs> yeah, okay. And, and the metaphor. So, you hear that, Dan? <laughs> and the metaphor that comes to mind, I read this many years ago, I'm sure you guys have heard this before, um, that the, the bamboo plant, apparently, when you originally plant it as, as a little thing, you don't see any upward growth for 10 years. And it's just laying down roots. And then the following year, it shoots up like 20 feet, which is, uh, anyway, yeah. Right, right, right. Okay, here's a very pretty diagram that kind of gives you a synopsis of the way. Now, he's not a singer god in this case. He's a bass player. But um, you get the idea. There is no better symbol, I think, than the serpent for an undulating string. Also, the serpent, according to Joseph Campbell, is uh, the symbol of um, uh, rebirth. Since for time immemorial, it's because they slough their skin every year. And so uh, here you see the tree of knowledge of good and evil and how the twin serpents, see this is clockwise, here's counterclockwise, and the twin serpents, um, become Adam's soul and you know it's symbol symbolically the tree of knowledge of good and evil but you see here when he takes a bite of the apple how he extends into knowledge of good and evil and there's 243 Avram before the H and we'll see why the H happens later 729 interestingly enough is the uh, epitome the embodiment of evil and Plato's tyrant was 729 times the philosopher king. So Plato knew these numbers. Um, I'm not sure how he got them, but this Pythagorean tradition was, uh, you know, it became uh, commandeered by the, these numbers became, the mathematics became commandeered by the Pythagorean tradition. Pythagoras studied in Egypt and, um, but um, Joran Freeberg, one of the leading lights on, on the math history of mathematics, tells us that he was studying Babylonian mathematics in Egypt. And of course, Abraham is a Babylonian. It's an also an interesting uh, perspective. There's a movement, there was a movement in the turn of the century, 20th century, uh, called Pan Babylonianism, which um, disparages the Hebrew scripture. And saying that, oh, they, they, Israel brought nothing to the game. It was all just a ripoff from Babylon. Well, hello, Abraham was Babylonian. <laughs> so give me a break. I mean, this is the, you know, the truth uh, surfaced as, as the Bible. But it came from Babylonian roots. That's certainly true. Um, so here, oh, now it's just a, an interesting perspective. We this is, looks like a two-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system, but he wasn't born yet, Descartes. Um, so when we look at a straight line, we're not seeing a straight line. An arithmetic progression is linear, measured in, you know, with a ruler, visual. Uh, this is a geometric progression, which is logarithmic. This alleged straight line when, when, for example, if God is uttering something, he's not uttering something, or you or I, we utter something and it doesn't go to the listener's ear directly. It's three in all dimension, in all, you know, all dimensions of space, you know, length, width, and depth. And then it surrounds the listener's head, right? And, and their ears absorb it. So similarly, um, a geometric progression, which is what these are, it has a common ratio. That's what connects them. And you see here, if this diagram is drawn correctly, it passes through two thirds, then four sixths, then six ninths, a common ratio. And that's what went into building the trees. Okay, these, so this pyramid structure is two thirds, and then it's reciprocal, three halves, six, four. So 
this reciprocity of frequency and wavelength or harmonic and arithmetic, which is an ancient analog of frequency and wavelength, is really the model for spirituality altogether. The material world and its, and its mirror-like image in, this, in the spiritual world. When Moses climbed to the top of Mount Sinai and was listening to God's whisper in, in, the, in the universe, the spiritual uh, triangle was invisible, but it was there. That's kind of the point, that we all have our spiritual side and reconciling our spiritual uh, inner voice with our material external body uh, became a thing. Um, and we'll actually get into that a bit later, pretty soon. How do we do that? How do you reconcile your inner spiritual self with your material body? That's a, an important aspect of this. But let's take a look at the secrets of the Merkaba, which is the chariot, Ezekiel's chariot. Well, before we do that, in the Sefer Yitzhar, there are three types of angels. This is long before the archangels appeared with lacy wings and, you know, there was an ophanim, which is just a, a tone circle. Sound was represented on a tone circle. And an octave tone circle became the heavenly firmament that was able to um, house all of the other tones. Um, and so a chayot is a tiny flame of sound and color. So the mother, the mother earth, the womb is the element earth, the primordial element earth, but it's the womb that gives birth to the rest of creation. So it's the circle, the womb. Chayot are the fathers, little flames of sound and color, powers of three, powers of five, powers of seven. Here's the musical principle or the physics principle. You can't get a new, an entirely new sound without a prime number. So six is a composite number. Are you, is something annoying you guys? Uh, my speaker, should I shut it up? Um, I think that, I think you're getting notifications through Facebook. Maybe if you just uh, close uh, Facebook, uh, then you won't hear the notifications, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not keeping my eye on any comments coming in. Oh, no, I know, I know. I think just the, the beeping sound, that's all, yeah. Oh, okay. But if you, you know, if you want to ask questions from the Facebook or whatever, I'm happy to try to answer them. Um, so powers of three, five, and seven uh, become the actual mathematical model for uh, wind, water, and fire. So two is earth, three is water, five is wind, and seven is five. And so the seraphim harmonizes all four of these primordial elements, singing kadosh, 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 holy, holy, holy. And the angelic choir is basically, there are four headed creatures, four four headed creatures pulling Ezekiel's chariot. And well, here's, here are the wheels of Ezekiel. And it's, and God is in the wheels. And so this, uh, the four wheels of Ezekiel is what powers the chariot. And basically, it's a primitive, not so very accurate, but early understanding of the harmonic series. Because the, the idea that sounds only come from prime numbers, six would be a composite number, two times three. So it's made of octaves and fifths. Two is octaves and three, powers of three are fifths. And when they talk about when Olam HaTikun reordering, you're going from a harmonic series and those vessels break into um, Tikun into uh, separate uh, malleable things. So like the soul was formed from earth and water. Uh, the body containing the soul was formed from earth, water within uh, the wind it, it, well, it's a little tricky to explain. Uh, we'll get into it soon, very soon. And the fire, uh, how it all relates, how they all interact. Let's get into it. This was a painting done by my mother. Six foot painting, hung in her house for many years, she passed. 
and here are the wheels of Ezekiel. Here are the four-headed creatures, okay? Um, the bull is, the ox is powers of two. Uh, it's sort of, you know, they, they furrow the land, you put the seeds in. Uh, but the ox, um, the man is, uh, is alter ego, the serpent uh, is water. Uh, wind is the eagle and the lion is fire is, is the number seven, powers of seven. So tikkun has to do with exponents. They apparently knew exponents back in the day. And here is the, one of the most important landmarks in the history of mathematics. YBC 7289, and it was Ernest McLean who introduced this to me, and I just found how, you know, what I did was spend time in figuring out how it could possibly be the mathematical underbelly of sin, as it turns out. Um, let me explain. Uh, is there, Am I just ya yammering away? Is there any, uh, do you have any... Do you want no, to ask him? No, no, this is, this is amazing. I, um, uh, does Reverend DeForest have any questions at this stage? Perhaps we no, no, I'm, I'm fine. I, you know, like I've heard this a few times, so it, it does take, and you know, how would you know this? It, it takes more than one hearing. Yes. Um, uh, and what I will do is if I've got something I think will help steer it and not necessarily steer it, but clarify something or offer an illustration that might help clarify a couple of things, I'll do that. But, um, yeah, it, 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 and, and I referenced this at the beginning. My opening comment was to say that that conscious, the conscious grasping of it is 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 at one level, and then for me, a kind of intuitive sense. Yes. Uh, it, so that it, so it's kind of like in the old days when I used to say, "In the old days, I'm dating myself." Patting your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time. It's kind of there's a, a bit of a cognitive dissonance here but uh well yeah. it's interesting that you you say that because cognitive dissonance we see visually but we hear logarithmically so uh you know the the, the arithmetic progression is linear the geometric progression is logarithmic but the harmonic progression has aspects of both um mm. because you know the arithmetic the linear aspect of a harmonic progression you, you know, if, if you know anything about electromagnetism, electromagnetic magnetic waves are like two serpents, the electrical part and the perpendicular intertwined magnetic part. And they don't travel apart, they travel together. And I, I, I believe they're inseparable. And so an electromagnetic current, similarly, the, the uh, uh, light, the harmonic, series and its reciprocal arithmetic series are two serpents that travel together. So um, the geometric part, so you might call the voice of God, the harmonic and arithmetic, but the hand of God that builds creation is the geometric. And he reaches down in, in what's a, now modern science is realizing is a multi-dimensional geometric so we're, we're looking at Bernard Riemann's topologies, multidimensional topologies to explore new dimensions. I mean, let me just make it a little aside about modern string theory. You know, um, the harmonic, th this was called, uh, this table, 231 gates, was um, basically the earliest conceptualization of God and creation. And then not really inseparable. I mean, they're, they're not really separable, but God was conceived of in terms of these three mathematical progressions. When we talk about integrating arithmetic geometry, uh, arithmetic uh, music, meaning uh, sound, the mathematics of sound, acoustic, arithmetic music geometry, what we're talking about is the 231 Gates table. And astronomy is sort of follows as above, so below. So you basically work out those three and then it reflects into the universe. So these are the laws of God. And the, the living God was what Abraham called the first, you know, the 231 gates was, was the living God. It defined the voice of God 
and um, the hand of God once you added the heavenly firmament and its geometry. So modern string theory, if, if the first string theory, uh, if Abrahamic's, the basis of monotheism was called uh, uh, the living God, then uh, modern theory of everything is, is a modernization of the 231 Gates table. And I can go through that in the last slide, I'll go through that in more detail. But for now, let's start with digging into this mathematics. Here on the left, we see Da Vinci kind of goofed. It's not that he goofed. How do you, he knew that the cir circle and the square were difficult to reconcile because the circle was man's spirituality and the square uh, or, or cube or square was man's um, material body. And so it became a geometer's problem of taking a compass and a square and certain number of steps and trying to equate the area of a circle with the area of a square. And basically in the 19th century, they, in the 1800s, they say impossible. And so squaring the circle became an expression to describe trying to do the impossible. Okay. Except that this is also in the Zohar we read that this is our most sacred, uh, Kabbalah's, Kabbalah's most sacred riddle, the riddle of the circle and the square inscribed within is the riddle of the Sabbath. And here's why. If we take the line, uh, which is the diagonal of the square, that is also the diameter of the circle, and we work out the math, we see imperfection. And uh, famously, I forgot his name. I wish Mitch Nur were here to remind me. But the Pythagoreans drowned the guy who revealed this imperfection in nature because the Pythagoreans were a cult of, of mystics and they drowned the guy who revealed that the, that the universe wasn't perfect. That how could this be a unit square and then the hypotenuse is, so this was the first use of the Pythagorean theorem some 1200 years before the birth of Pythagoras. So the, the Greeks like to put their name on, uh, on, you know, on anonymous Babylonian mathematical achievements. This is a perfect example. AKA stuff they did not write. <laughs> yes, exactly. Now this came down, this was found in Shusha uh, there, there were, uh, you know, from the land of the Aryans, which is etymologically evolved into the name Iran. So, um, and, and the, um, there's a whole, another whole PowerPoint that I get into the Nephilim and the Natufians who became the Aryans, but that's way outside the scope of this little talk. Um, but this is correct to six decimal places. This is the most accurate in history to this point. And uh, so what we get here is this is the actual cuneiform and the actual tablet that was discovered. And, you know, McLean is like a divine, was like a divining rod. He knew just what to go to, to focus on. He didn't understand necessarily all of the facets of it, but, you know, he, he understood its importance and relevance. Um, here is the mathematics of Adam's soul in heaven, and here's his soul after he takes a bite of the apple. So you see the chayot as they make their way around the circle. If you start at one, you know, you find uh, that three is over here. I guess the resolution's not too good. Here we can see the resolution. Go from one to three, right, to nine, so you're traveling in a circle of fifths to so one over 27, one over 181, two four, whoops, we, let me go back, sorry. And so anyway, this is a bite of the apple and here's evil itself and here's knowledge of good and evil. Here are the serpents going, going clockwise and counterclockwise, ascending and descending until they find their home on the octave container. So, I mean, miraculously to me, 
um, the Ari, Isaac Luria, somehow knew that this heavenly firmament was a circle. And somehow, anyway, I don't know. Uh, he didn't know the actual numbers, but with language, he came so close to actually knowing what was going on. So I have a great respect for the Kabbalistic knowledge of the rabbis. Um, I'm just trying to add a deeper layer, if you will. So here is uh, another attempt at uh, sound, uh, the serpents going in two directions. So let's see if I can uh, try to play it again. I'm not sure if my speaker has fallen asleep or not, but let's try it. Let me take this out. I'll see you in a, speak to you in a minute. Okay. Um. okay. Can I just say, Howard, I've mentioned this before, just how you've put together this presentation alone is amazing, <laughs> let alone all the researches, but it's beautifully done. I really appreciate it. Thank you so it much. Thank you. Really well, I've, had, I've had a few years to... Well, yeah. I mean, it's many, many people have a few years. I mean, this is amazing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. my pleasure. I mean, this is... Uh... Of course, my wife is ready to throw my books. <laughs> I'm not allowed to talk about Abraham if she's in the room. <laughs> but that's beside the point. <laughs> but she supports you. That's the amazing thing. She so. does. She does. She does. Okay. So here is the tree of life. And again, these are symbols that come from here. Here is the actual the geometric progression that become the tree of knowledge and the tree of... Now, the interesting thing is that I can take this mathematical table uh, and there is... I've sort of translated it into Sumerian, into base 60, and that older version becomes the model for all of the creation allegories from ancient Sumer, uh, Akkadian stuff, you know, with the Assyrian and Babylonian, um, Neo-Babylonian, Ugaritic... In other words, the same mathematics is underneath all of religion, whether it's polytheistic or monotheistic. And how could it, by the way, how could the same could, mathematics be underneath Plato's humanistic philosophy? So that's sort of, you, you've got to square the circle if you can yeah, forgive the yeah. expression. But go ahead. What we, and I can. Uh, it, but go yeah, I, it, it, it only, what I was going to say was that how could it not? I was going to say exactly the same thing. Yeah, how could it not? Yeah, how could it not? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, it, and that's the beauty of this. And that's the kind of intuitive sense that I get. Like there, there were moments early on in your presentation when you talked about there being so many different, uh, so many different laws and things that, 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 that of the Mosaic tradition. I'm reminded of a scripture where the people heard the first of the Ten Commandments. You know, when God called, I mean, when, when Moses called together the, the congregation, the assembly is what it was, all of the elders and so forth. Mm -hmm. They heard 10 and they said, we cannot hear yet another word. Exactly. We can hear no more. We can, you know, who is it that can hear the voice of God and survive it? Who is it that can see the, the, the fire and the fearsome smoke from this mountain, Oreb, and survive. But they were the people who had both heard these Ten Commandments, and they had also seen it and lived. And they said, we're going to go back to the tent, uh, back to the, uh, not the tent, we're going to go back to the, to the village or to wherever it was that they were. You stay, Moses. Whatever it else it is that God has to say to us, have him say it to you. 
then you come and tell us what it is that God said. And when they leave, this our pledge to you is that we will do whatever it is that God tells you to tell us. When they leave, God says to Moses, they have spoken well to say this. And it's a marvelous uh, 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 story of an encounter of a people who don't know what to do you know, when they hear the voice of God, it scares them to death. They are convinced that they could not survive such an encounter. And God says to them, they have spoken well. Because now you know what happens. They give Moses a fit in the desert. You know what I mean? So it's not like they're going to do what it is. That they, they're not, they ain't going to do what they have, have agreed to do. But it is, it is one of those moments that kind of reveals... Uh, and, and I was thinking also about another and another point when you were talking about this ecstatic speech. There is a, a tradition among Pentecostals, and it goes back to what's referred to as the day of Pentecost, when when, when people, Galileans, allegedly, were all speaking various languages, the languages of these individuals who had gathered together at the festival of weeks, uh, which is now called Pentecost. And how this ecstatic speech reveals something that is deeper than words. I'm also mindful, and excuse me for rambling a bit there. I got to, as these things kind of come up. No, no, go ahead. Paul, Paul, in one of his letters, Paul says, the spirit itself will intercede on you, what with sighs, S-I-G-H-S, that are too deep for words. So it will speak the angel, the spirit, that the spirit that knows you, it knows what it is, the spirit of God that knows you and knows what you need before they ask, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. Will intercede when you don't know how to pray, which we do not. When you don't know how to pray, the spirit will intercede on you, intercede on your behalf with sighs that are too deep for words. So, there, I mean, there are all of these threads that run through this, that even when I'm, con even when I am not consciously aware or to kind of like, kind of like say, oh yeah, that makes sense. Uh, uh, there is another awareness, a deeper awareness that keeps strumming the a chord that is deep inside of me that I cannot ignore. And even if I, even if if someone would say to me, "What in the world is Howard talking about?" I have to admit, I must say, half the time I don't know what he's talking about. But there is something about what it is that he is saying that is a that is a that I am convinced is a profound truth. I could, and because I don't understand it, I ain't going to let the fact that I don't understand it get in the way. In fact, the fact that I don't understand it, if I got half a mind, will make me run all the more headlong to it. I love that. Thank you. So I, I, that's been very much my experience where it's, it, it's beyond my rational comprehension, much if not most of this. But it, it somehow resonates. I love the metaphor that you use of strumming. You know, that it resonates mm -hmm. on a deeper level. Right. And I mean, as you know, this isn't my first time here that hearing this, but uh, I remember the other times I heard this one and a half times uh, previously, um, I felt this profound spiritual um, during the, the course of the, the evening that evening, it's profound spiritual sort of joy. And I was like, what, mm -hmm. what is that? It's, I was unusual. Oh, I realize it's, <laughs> it's our presentation. It's all this incredible it, it's stuff that gets gets you on a, on a super rational level. And I think, right. um, not to go on and on and on about this, but very, very quickly, <laughs> one of the obsessions, I, th I think it's an important point to make, right, that one of the obsessions we have as modern human beings, right, modern humans have this obsession with uh, reason, but reason historically right. was separate from intellect or intellection. Intellection was always considered higher than, than reason. Reason is, is right. actually a base level mm -hmm. of understanding. Right. Um, and, and intellection is really this sort of intuitive. I mean, it's sort of, it, it, it goes hand in hand in many ways with intuition right. and it's where right. you find the divine right. light shines right. and so forth. Yeah. Anyway. Right. Yeah. It, it does make you, if you will pardon the expression, it does make you babble. If I can, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it'll make you, because it, it'll start, it, it, it's a it's a language that's somewhere else. It's like yes. I've been reading a number of different rather esoteric books only because I find them so fascinating at some level. But in the, this one uh, Ekenkar, they talk about soul travel, and they say how the ancients pass one another in this realm, 
And they don't speak. They wave at each other. They just kind of wave. And they don't wave like, hey, how you doing? But they wave. And in the wave, there is a transmission of information and knowledge. And in the Black church, wow. mothers, when they either hear a prayer, hear a song, or hear a sermon that resonates with them in a way that they may not speak about it. They may say amen, they may not. But every now and again, a hand will go up. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. that affirm something deep and abiding and, and, and powerful operating on a number of different levels at the same time that if you ask them what yeah. that meant, they will not be able to tell you. But, that, but, but it doesn't matter that they can't tell you. The, mm -hmm. the communication is in the wave of the hand. And now I will stop. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful, Reverend First, as always. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me just say that uh, the, the scene that you uh, depicted here of Moses hearing uh, is a really, it's sort of proof that uh, of what monotheism is, that the harmonic series was a very important integral part of the conceptualization of monotheism insofar as, you know, it sounded like thunder to the Israelites and that maybe they heard one or two, uh, but, but the idea that at the level of prophecy that Moses was, he could differentiate means he understood the mathematics basically. And, and the individual sounds that went into the whole of a sound because every sound is made up of all these components. And to me, the other, another nice symbolic thing is when Moses threw his serpent down and it ate all the other serpents, right? In other words, monotheism sort of uh, trumped uh, polytheism in a way. Uh, and, and the idea is that, um, but, but this brings up a question. How could the same mathematics structure the 10 commandments that structured the 10 plates? Mm. I mean, it seems, and how, how could the same mathematics structure Plato's humanistic dialogues versus uh, the, the Tanakh, you know, the, the Torah's uh, monotheistic uh, writings. And then how could the same mathematics structure the Sumerian creation allegory? The earliest record is the Kesh temple hymn. Guess what the temple is right here. This is the temple. If you put this into a Sumerian version, it makes sense. The mathematics makes sense of, the Sumer of all the creation allegories. You know, the scholars, I believe, have been able to show um, that the flood story has different versions. I mean, um, you know, George Smith in the last century, a curator at the, uh, a, a seriologist at the British Museum, showed, and that, that was a very tumultuous lecture that he gave, but it showed that there's an earlier version than scripture of the flood story. And since then, um, Irving Finkel, uh, who I've had the pleasure of meeting, um, also uh, came up with a text, an Akkadian text, that, that was an earlier version. So there, these, there's a Sumerian version, an Akkadian version, and, and same thing with creation allegory. But I don't believe the scholars have a handle or you know, have had a handle on how how to homogenize them, what's common, you know? And, and so here's the sea, the sea of numbers. But the idea is that this mathematics explains the most, all of the ancient creation allegories. And, you know, I'm trying to work on a third book that actually demonstrates that. Um, okay, so here we are. Now here is a very kind of tricky thing that musicians might get more than a non-musician. How to become a holy man. <laughs> you start with a plain old pyramid, which is a tree of life, and you impose an octave limit on it. So you st to stuff it into an octave, to transpose this cycle of fifths, right? And this cycle of thirds, you know, if you're stacking building blocks, you know, do, re, mi, fa, sol, do, re, mi, fa, sol, and you keep going up in fifths, you can't sing that. I can only, you know, I two octave range. 
it's not singable. A cycle of fifths is very, you know, it doesn't sound melodic. So what, these are called tuning systems, all right? Uh, powers of two and three give you Pythagorean, well, now Western musicologists call it Pythagorean tuning. Obviously it, it, it preceded Pythagoras, but, uh, and then, um, you know, there's just tuning. There's, you, when you include the prime number seven, you have Arctis tuning, which was a friend of Plato's. So um, the idea is to squeeze it into a single octave. And that's what you do here by imposing the 360, 720 octave. These now create, mel this is a melody. I mean, these are the notes for a, a one octave melody. It's singable. And the holy man has to access the vibrations of his soul and make them singable. And so they burn away on the, the on the, um, on the, um, the altar, um, the four-horned altar. Okay, here's the four-horned altar. He, he, here's the mathematical model for this. Okay. And when you've uh, burned away all the impurities, you're left with a singable scale that Enoch could ascend to God on. You know, you basically have to become a musician. You have to access the, the vibrations of your soul. Um, I mean, there's a wonderful movie that, one of my favorite movies, Groundhog Day. And you watch, I don't know, there's a Dan Aykroyd evolved from a complete jerk into a, a refined artist and musician. And you see the music coming out of him. And he did a statue of Andy McDowell that looked like a Rodin. I mean, the, the soul expresses itself as it evolves. And as many lifetimes as it might take, people will all get there, but they have to know that it's this tardum of practice that Abraham saw as the shortcut. This was the way to become a prophet, how to learn how to pray like a prophet. You evolve into a musician effectively. Um, so here is, um, and here, by the way, the Rig Veda, I mean, I have a whole another presentation that I believe DeForest saw describing how there was a meeting of the minds. You know how we commonly speak of Cordoba as this wonderful meeting between Maimonides and Averroes and, and, and the period of peace for a few centuries where the, everybody in, in Cordoba, Spain, um, there was this intellectual atmosphere and everybody tried to uh, reach across the aisle, so to speak. Well, there was a, a, a more momentous meeting of the minds in, in 17, around 1700 BC. The beginnings of the Rig Veda took place in the city of Haran. And I done some homework to, I have a, no, a whole nother presentation, how it would have been, um, uh, there were five years that Abraham spent in Haran and these master, meditators taught him moksha and he taught them the mathematics that he had mastered so this is a theory speculation but i believe that it's backed up by a lot of um, good considerations now here are the musical scales that come of and here's the, what you can see here is the um, the sefer yitzira but you know from here, go out and calculate. In other words, you're not done. These are just the indexes on the ends. 24, 120, 720, you know, uh, 5,040. Here's the actual Sabbath scale um, that a prophet would have to learn how to sing. And this mathematics is shared on the right between the Rig Veda. So we know that there was a meeting of the minds because the mathematics is complex and identical between the Rig Veda and the Sefer Yetzirah. One became the foundation text of Hinduism and Buddhism, and the Sefer Yetzirah, of course, the three Abrahamic texts, and I believe uh, Taoism. But um, this is uh, shared mathematics. So this is proof positive that the authors of these two texts uh, and I believe they were 
basically, Abraham was looking for to prove that that mathematics of sin could be resolved. And it was the, 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 the um, they weren't Aryans yet. The, the, these, <laughs> they hadn't made it into Iran or into the Indus Valley. These were the Natufians. Um, anyway, I'm going too far afield here. Let's just continue. This master meditation idea today is uh, uh, the Tibetan monks. And Tumo is, is a vase breath. This is how you get around that. Um, uh, the, the square root of two is with this vase breath. Um, so it's Tardama, and I can give a whole talk on this. But here's what's key. 777, the Jubilee or the 49th year. I, uh, I should have a better slide of that. Uh, so basically, when you do this Abrahamic Tardama practice, uh, you know, it's seven circuits around the sacred cube. And you know that that's a common shared practice among Muslims, because according to Arab legend, the Kaaba was rebuilt by Abraham and Ishmael. It was originally Adam and Eve's dwelling when they were given the boot from Eden. And seven circuits around the sacred cube was a practice that preceded Muhammad by a couple of thousand years at least. Here's a rendering uh, of a friend of mine, Chuck Vence, who, who drew this. And you see seven angels blowing seven tone circles and the new Jerusalem descending from heaven. So that's the Christian version. This is on the last page of the New Testament it's described. Here's the Rebbe, um, Menachem Schneerson, Lubavitcher Rebbe, laying tefillin, seven circuits, a sacred cube. Here is the... Um, Joshua's gen, uh, his generals were priests with trumpets. And once again, seven circuits around the promised city. So um, I guess I didn't explain. Boy, that, well, let's just take it. Uh, hopefully I included the right slide. Um, so the complexity of identical mathematics. Okay, I mentioned this. Abraham left Ur for Haran at 70 years of age, and he left Haran for Egypt at 75. Vedic scholars also know that Rig Veda was written somewhere in the vicinity. We know it was Haran in Turkey because Natufian Aryan descendants of the master meditators lived in and around Gobekli Tepe, which, uh, which was on the Haran plain. That's the first religious temple. And the Natufians back 10,000 BC uh, anyway, that's a whole nother presentation. It's the largest but... monolithic site in the world, and oldest rather, the oldest monolithic site in the world. Yes. I have a whole nother presentation about it, but let's just uh, start to finish up. The Rig Veda became the foundation text for Hindu and Buddhism. The Book of Creation became the foundation text for the three Abrahamic faiths. Here is a, 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 the oldest, according to uh, a paper, recently written paper, this is the oldest a word for God, uh, the, the, the Natufians at Gobelki Tepe, you find this symbol at Kabul Hayek, I believe, as well as Gobelki Tepe and many other places around Haran and Gobelki Tepe. Uh, but this is before mathematics. They just knew how to get things up the central path of the body. The mathematics, I believe, came in around the sixth millennium BC. Uh, the Aryans that came and settled the first city of Iridu around 5400 BC during the Ubaid period. I believe those are the guys who sort of invented mathematics. The Semitic tribes started invading Sumer around uh, the fourth millennium BC. And it was the dynamic, according to Samuel Noah Kramer, uh, the authority on Sumer, it was this cross fertilization between the Natufian, uh, between the Aryans, what well, he called them pre Sumerians from 5400 to 4100 BC. These pre-Sumerians then, once the Semitic tribe started invading, it was the cross fertilization that, that is responsible for um, writing and mathematics, etc. cetera. Uh, but here's the actual mathematics of what's going on here. And here's the Rig Veda. Uh, and here's 12 spoke wheel. This is how it appears in the Rig Veda. I think in hymn one, 164, uh, 
um, you'll you'll find this. And there's the Holy Trinity within the Vedic world. Within, you've got Shiva. Um, I'm sorry, Vishnu, on this bed of serpents, twelve, I believe, and L Brahma being born in a lotus, coming out of an umbilical cord, and Shiva is the third party. Ah, oh, here we go. Okay, thank you. I was asked to put everything into a single slide. And so here is my single slide. If I were to sum up the whole shooting match in a single slide, let's see if I'm able to, this is what it might look like. Here is the holiest name of God, okay? In the Tanya, which I, as I said, is an Lurianic type text written by the first Lubavitch Rebbe in the 1700s, Schneer Zalman of Lieti. He says, the figure of a bird, which represents Metatron, God's highest ranking angel. His head is the letter Yud, right? Yud, uh, which is here. His, uh, the body is the letter Vav, which is the spinal cord, sort of. And the two wings are the two letters He, the wings. So this is metaphor. Metaphor for... Um, God's highest ranking angel is man's soul. And the two wings of man's soul, which is the Vav, basically it's meant to be a metaphor for the, a, a mathematical metaphor for raising the base, which is what um, you know an exponent does when you're dealing with logarithmic exponents. You, you've got a base, and they used base 60. So 60 to the fifth power is this number. And this 777-600,000 is the number that ties to scripture. So you've got to go through all of this rigmarole that took me years to come up with this, and then you can tie it to scripture. So we will now tie it to scripture. So let's see. You'd, let me read through this part. Yahweh is a base 60 mathematical metaphor for raising logarithmic bases yud and vav by exponent hey. These are the two wings, ruach hakodesh, the word ruach translates to spirit, um, wind, and breath of God. And the ruach hakodesh uh, is the letter he, which is the number five, which became part of Abra Abram's name to make him Abraham. So the Holy Spirit dwelled within him. In the Tetragrammaton that metaphorically raised the serpentine appetites of the animal soul up to the Godhead, both math mathematically and literally. So these two serpents lead us astray. You know, they've always been associated with sin, the serpent. And one is earth and the other is water. And they're both downward primordial elements that bring us downward towards sin. And it's the wings that have to lift us out of the muck. Okay, so earning your wings is a whole nother story. Um, oh, so a literal liberation of the soul from its captivity within the body. So the animal soul, serpentine appetites of the animal soul up to the Godhead, both mathematically and literally. Uh, according to Kabbalah, we have a, a, an a, a animal soul and a divine soul. A literal liberation of the soul from its captivity within the body is accomplished by pronouncing, quote, pronouncing God's name, not verbally, but as a mental articulation of Abraham's Tartama trance meditation of seven circuits around the sacred cube. So the Hajj and the New Jerusalem and tefillin are basically Abraham's sacred practice. Now it derives from the seven Noahide laws. The Talmud tells us it's something totally different, but those are the seven Noahide laws as well, because it's, you know, Noah was able to, uh, although he may not have been a, a, a Semite, he, Enoch, Noah, Shem, uh, knew, and Melchizedek knew how to pronounce the holy name. In other words, what they knew is how to do moksha, because it wasn't Tartama yet, uh, which is seven times in the Bible. Uh, it, it was moksha, liberation, the main Eastern practice. It became the main Eastern practice of liberation. So here's how it's set into the scripture, and here's how. Now realize this is just the tip of the iceberg. We're dealing with the holiest name of God, how it structures Genesis, okay? 
And after Cain sinned, God set the mark of Cain on his head so that no one would kill him before the seven generations allotted to him for repentance. Seven generations later, Cain's descendant Lamech accidentally killed Cain while hunting. Okay, Lamech was in the, the, the sinful line of Cain, but, uh, but he accidentally killed him. And when he's confronted by God, he says, you know, he asked God to spare him for 77 generations since his sin, unlike Cain's, was unintentional. Within the patriarchal lineage of Seth, the only other, uh, Adam's son Seth, the only other Lamech was the righteous father of Noah. Noah's father died at exactly 777 years old, five years, an angel's wing before the flood would purge Cain's evil from the earth. Lamech's death at 777 embodies the righteousness made possible by performing Abraham's Sabbath prayer, number seven, every week for seven years, comprising a sabbatical, and for seven sabbaticals comprising a jubilee. In this manner, this is the level of prophecy, by the way. In this manner, the deep and hidden gematria of the Holy Tetragrammaton defines Sabbath introspection, sabbatical purification, and jubilee liberation as 777 liberates the soul on the on wings. Though Abraham's Sabbath prayer taught him, as Leviticus 25 tells us regarding the jubilee year, to rest the soil, to... Um, to um, return uh, landed property to its original owner, to free slaves, and to uh, free oneself from sin and remit one's soul back to God. In, it defines the book of Exodus, or structures the book of Exodus, or models the book of Exodus as follows. Moses, who reached the level of prophecy, led the Israelites. Now, it doesn't say 600,001, okay? It specifically says, um, Exodus 12, 37 says, and the people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. So it specifically mentions this, and in so doing, ties in the name of God to the entire metaphor of Targum. And that should be a good place to stop. The one remaining slide has to do with how the 231 Gates table has been modernized. All right, <laughs> let me just take a breath. You can try reading that, but I'm gonna read it. Let me just uh, grab a sip of water if you- Amazing. In the last 30 years of his life, Einstein searched for what he called the exquisite rationality of the world structure. Unfortunately, he was an, unable to discover the comprehensive mathematical framework for a unified field theory that would articulate common ground for the big four forces of nature, namely gravity, electromagnetic, and the strong and weak forces of the atom. In 1984, two physicists, Michael Green and John Schwartz, figured out the unified theory that Einstein was expecting to find. Green and Schwartz's discovery of superstring theory was followed by Ed Witten's 1995 discovery of M theory, which are today's leading candidates for a theory of everything. Now, when I first saw uh, the New York Times Sunday Magazine section in 1987, where Ed Witten described the harmonic series as the, the, the underlying mathematics of, of everything, I just burst into tears because, <laughs> you know, it was uh, something that I had been working on and was pushing with with Ernest and, and you know that that the harmonic series was the the was underneath everything, and that intuition was right, and you know and as much as I learned from Ernest, um, you know I tried to understand modern physics, so there's a, a little chapter on it in the back of my first two books, but here's what the third book is going to talk about. Bernard Riemann has developed the Riemann hypothesis and Riemann topologies to explore the abstract multidimensional geometric space of superstring theory and M theory. Let me just say that superstring theory for the math to work requires 10 dimensions. You know, we know about length, width, and depth as space, three dimensions. Einstein taught us about the 
the space-time continuum with time being the fourth. But for this math to work, there are 10, okay? So there's six hidden dimensions. And with Ed, Ed Witten's uh, M theory, there are 11, because we don't live in a universe, apparently. According to Witten, we live in a multiverse. And the 11th is like dark, if I get this right, and any physicist can feel free to correct me. Dark plasma, if, if, if each universe is a slice of bread, then the loaf of bread is the multiverse, which and each universe is connected by dark matter as sort of the 11th dimension and connector between the, the universes. So let me continue. The Riemann hypothesis of Riemann topologies to explore the abstract multidimensional geometric space of superstring theory and M theory. Riemann's work laid the groundwork for Einstein's theory of relativity. Let me just say that some people say Riemann figured it out and Einstein got credit for it. As well, which I'm not, you know, going <laughs> to venture an opinion either way. As well as much of what is being explored today. Advances in mathematics and physics have married calculus, differential geometry, the zeta function, prime number theory, and Fourier transforms, which would effectively modernize the integrated mathematical disciplines within the 231 Gates table. Although Riemann, Einstein, Schwartz, or Green have never heard of the 231 Gates table, they are nevertheless intent on modernizing its mathematics. Since the book of creation defined the original conceptualization of God as history's first theory of everything, by proving M theory and, and the Riemann hypothesis, what would effectively uh, that would effectively prove the existence of God as articulated by the 231 Gates table. Let me just say that monotheism is different than, from polytheism in that, for the first time, the harmonic series was recognized as a natural phenomenon. So this mathematics of the rainbow, I don't believe it was seen that way. You know, polytheism. If you can imagine this as a, as a simplification, but it's very true, I believe, the different gods were different harmonics, whereas for Abraham, it was all a single uh, one god with different vibrational aspects to it. And that's the real difference between polytheism and monotheism. Anyway, that should do it. I think I can safely stop my share. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Well, uh, it's, uh, I mean, again, as I mentioned before, it's the mind boggles. It's, uh, yeah. And any, any thoughts, uh, Reverend DeForest, questions, comments? Yeah, I, you know, the, um, it, it, it is, it's, you know, it, it bears, yes, it bears hearing over and over again. Uh, you know, I am reminded uh, that, and, and this became particularly true uh, in our Bible study as we're looking at, um, we're in Deuteronomy now. But the text, not the, the text itself, but there are elements in the text that keep repeating themselves. There are these things that you hear over and over and over. The Lord your God, when the Lord your God does this, when the Lord your God does that. There must be a reason for the repetition uh, of these these almost catchphrases, if you will, way to kind of, you know, and uh, and maybe people who do ads, you know, um, what do they call those folks? Uh, anyway, they know that because they repeat things enough to kind of break it into your, because you have to hear it a number of times. I don't know. People say you have to hear it five times, 17 times, whatever it is, for it to kind of break into your consciousness. But you know, part of it is because the people of Israel were going into a, into a land that was foreign to them. And, you know, the people in those lands had their own systems of practice. And this new people who were coming in were going to have to make their way in the context of a people who were not, who had not, you know, that they had not known before. But more to the point, it seems to me, that these are things that you do have to hear over again over and over again for them to become become almost it's almost like muscle memory if you will uh, a, a notion where something that you had this aha moment that you've been hearing it over and over again but you didn't quite it didn't quite click 
until something happened, like that moment you said, uh, 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 Howard, where you broke into tears when you had read something that became crystal clear to you that you had been studying for however many years before that. Um, and it puts you in a position where you could actually understand it at a level that you hadn't understood it and that it would have made no sense to you at all if you hadn't been studying it. But somehow these two things, these vector points kind of came together. These points kind of came together and a light went on. Um, and, and I, you know, that, that's what's kind of what it is that been my experience of this, because uh, it, it, for a long time, it seemed uh, I would have flashes of insight uh, broken up by mounds of what? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> huh? Um, but yeah, and, and it's, it, these flashes of insight are profound enough uh, that they push me past what it is that I can't actually explain. And I've gotten to the place that I said a little while ago that, that you know, there's a part of me that doesn't want to explain this. Uh, if I can use the, the analogy that I've used about the butterfly, you reach for the butterfly and it manages to flit away from you. But if you ever catch it, then you look at your fingers, you've got powder on your fingers and you ruin the butterfly. Beautiful, yes. So that the notion is if we could ever get, if we could figure this thing out, we would make a mess of it. Uh, and so maybe that is why we are not supposed to figure it out in the way that we think of figuring it out, this kind of conscious awareness that we that then want to kind of claim and own and monetize or worse, uh, uh, weaponize. Uh, that, that's been this, this, this certainly was the struggle uh, with Jesus. It, 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 then now uh, the, 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 the laws of Moses, which were, in, were, were the law and the prophets were intended to free people. Um, and then what, what, did, what did people do who had gained some knowledge of what to do with it? They turned them from, from uh, 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 elements of liberation to elements of subjugation, uh, forcing people to do things that they had themselves no intention of doing. Um, you know, so I think we befoul it if we understand it and ought to be carried along by it as opposed to trying to carry it along with us. There's a difference between the religion of Jesus and a religion about Jesus. Uh, a religion about Jesus, you can make whatever it is you wish to make. Uh, but a one about the, the religion of Jesus, I should say, is a religion that will, you know, ultimately, you know, may find, you may find yourself on a cross somewhere. Well, that's just my, you know, that's yeah, my um, babbling for the moment. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm welcome certainly um uh one takeaway that i think is important if you do take away anything it's that trans meditation is a spiritual thing and that this was the way uh, this this you know what you know you say that christians talk about christ is the lord well he was kyrie lord was he was not yahweh lord is mm -hmm. capital l lowercase o r d whereas um uh, Yahweh is would translate it to small caps L O R D. So the idea that Christ needed a practice or that he had a practice to do the transfiguration and resurrection, you know, it goes against much of what is taught in the church, I think. Mm -hmm. Could be wrong. But I think that uh, Muhammad is known to have a, had uh, a long many years of meditation with Abu Bakr in the cave, I think. So, and, and nobody talks about Moses as a meditator, but, you know, the tent of meeting where God mm. would come in and speak to him, you know, that, that tent was, you know, these are called holy mountains, ziggurats, tents. So the tent of meeting is a holy place because it's man's temple, his mm -hmm. own temple. The third temple is within Right? Mm -hmm. And we have to learn how to make it usable so that we can become mm -hmm. holy men. Mm -hmm. And Tardama is the way to get there. So within Islam, you know, um, uh, to weed is the oneness of God, but the way you get there is tawaf at the Hajj. The way you approach the Godhead is through tawaf, circling. 
And, and uh, I believe this book, if I've done my job correctly, uh, if, you know, hopefully, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to reach out to uh, an Islamic audience because, the, you know, the Islamic tradition talks about the scrolls of Abraham. But according to the Islamic tradition, it's been lost. And so I believe there is only one scrolls of Abraham, whether you call it that or Sefer Yitzhira. And the fact that it structures the Hebrew Bible tells me that this is a real document, that this needs to be taken seriously, which it never was. And that it behooves clergy of all three Abrahamic faiths to take a fresh look at it. And meditate. Trance meditation. Tardama means deep sleep or trance. And right. it, it, it's not your usual. You need to get into that hypnagogic state between waking and sleeping that opens the door to the other side. Right. And, you know. Yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, uh, Howard, um, Mr. Howard Schatz. And uh, thank you so much, as always, uh, thank you, thank you. Reverend uh, DeForest Raphael. Um, and thank you, Hassan, for this. Uh, oh, no, no, it's really my pleasure. Yeah. And, uh, and, and on her, really, I mean, I'm just. I'm just standing here. Speaking of practice, <laughs> I mean, it's I, I, it's interesting. I, I mean, I'm not going to go on and on about this, but embodied practice is is something that um, I've thought a little about and read uh, a considerable amount about and on. And so, I mean, we are embodied beings, right? So, how mm -hmm. we practice things, how we sort of um, comport ourselves physically, has a very real uh, spiritual impact uh, on us. It has a very real psychological impact. I mean, we know this mm -hmm. through, you know, modern science. For some reason, that's like the measure of all things now. That's true. But anyway, we'll go with that for now. Um, and, and certainly all the uh, major and minor traditions have known this for the longest time, that however, how we comport ourselves has a very real, tangible spiritual impact on our souls. So, so this really goes to confirm uh, uh, all of that in a very sort of deep, profound mind boggling and, and, and sort of earth shattering and spiritually re rejuvenating manner. So I'm deeply, deeply appreciate, uh, appreciative uh, to you, uh, Howard, for this incredible dedication. I mean, just the dedication that you've put into this for 45 years, that's no joke. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so God bless you and please, uh, we'll, we'll, you and I and uh, us three will continue to be in touch, uh, of course, yes. and Great. Uh, we'll, uh, I look forward to, to further interactions like this. And, uh, and uh, my, my sense is that this is, a right, this is the right time for more people to be uh, aware of your work. I think you've been putting mm -hmm. down your roots for 45 years. So now they, they sort of... <laughs> now, right, yeah. Now it's time for the bonsai tree to break forth. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah.